Thank you, Diane. So I had a plan for organizing this talk. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, could any, could you guys move forward a little? I'll, I'll try to yell, but you might have to remind me. Okay, so I had a plan for organizing this talk and the original talk began, St. Saviors has 40 stained glass windows, 32 pictorial windows, four geometric dormer windows, three leaded glass in the sacristy and one that's leaning against a wall in the rectory. Of those 40 windows, 11 are in the opalescent or American style, like the Tiffany windows. One is in the aesthetic style and 10 more are in a more English style, like the Heaton Butler and Bain windows, like the one um, above the altar. Another 11 are more modern and fall outside both categories. So that was how the talk was going along until yesterday when I noticed something really odd and kind of intriguing as I assembled all the documents and slides for this talk. The evidence for this is circumstantial. So I'm gonna walk you through my reasoning process. I feel a little bit like a, a lawyer preparing a brief for court. But this all began with an attempt to correlate the timeline of the window installations with the architectural changes here. Now at every church, Certain stories have become part of the building's history, but are not totally um, factual. <laughs> and I always feel a little awkward about contradicting oral history because I know people often have a deep emotional attachment to their place of worship. And I also don't want to sound like I'm scolding anyone for their archives or lack of archives. I totally understand churches are not museums. The mission here is the well-being and spiritual care of a community, and space and time are always short. Volunteers never have enough time, and filing cabinets are always overflowing. So please don't take offense when I say that documents are missing or that information is wrong. My job is to set the record straight. So in this case, the Helmuth window, which is over in the north transept there. I know that the received history is that this was the first stained glass window in the church and that it was installed over the altar in the original building. I have to tell you, neither of those is true. Yeah, now here's how we know. The original building was constructed in 1877. This is a little, see if that works. We're having difficulties. Does this work? Is that helping? No, no, I'll just yell. <laughs> uh, and so the altar was in what is now the north transept. In April of 1886, William Todd Helmuth, the donor of this window, had sent a letter to the vestry requesting permission to install a window in memory of his father. In July of 1886, the vestry approved the request. Now, also in 1886, the church had undergone a massive enlargement, adding the nave, the tower, and the circular chancel. And the orientation of the church shifted with the altar now in the new chancel. The building was reconsecrated in August of 1886. So when Helmuth's request was approved in July, the building was already complete. So clearly the window was installed after the, the altar was relocated. Um, two slightly unrelated but interesting facts about that window. The initials refer to the donor's infant daughter, Amelia J. Helmuth, who died in 1864, and his brother, Oliver Helmuth, who died in 1866. And I'm telling you that because it took me, you would not believe how long sorting through genealogical records. So I'm like, that is going out in the world. <laughs> Um, also, the window is mentioned in a publication from 1887, so the window had to have been installed either late in 1886 or early 1887. Now, what makes me think this was not the first stained glass window in the church? Well, for one, this is a detail of the first church, and there's clearly decorative glass in that window. 
then after the expansion, there were decorative windows in the chancel and the rose window. And we still have what we think is one of the original nave windows. So we know that there were stained glass windows in both the original church and the enlarged church, all of which came before the Helmuth window. The Helmuth window is, as far as I can tell, the first pictorial window and the first memorial window here at St. Saviors. But what then is the oldest window at St. Saviors? Now here's where I got really interesting. Um, if you're the kind of person who really enjoys looking at tiny details and grainy old photos, when the chancel was expanded in 1902, the architect's blueprint gave detailed instructions about the windows that were going to be displaced by the construction should go. And we know that there were changes between when this particular plan was drawn and when things were built, but this gives us a really good idea of what was there when construction began. Among other interesting details, the memo says, Quote, the three small windows back of present organ are to be placed in vestry room and are marked B. The vestry room on the plan is the sacristy just north of the chancel now, and there are three leaded glass windows in there. They're very simple geometric windows. I had never paid them much attention. I don't think anyone has really looked at them since 1902 when they got moved. Now, look closely at the photo of that 1878 window. I find it's often easier to see details of stained glass in old photos if you invert the image so that the lead lines are white. Here, you can make out a pattern of alternating diamond paint sections and square paint sections. The photo on the left is the outside of one of the sacristy windows. The pattern is awfully similar to that in the 1878 windows. I think it's probable that the windows tucked away in the sacristy are from the original building, which would make them 144 years old. And not only the oldest windows here at St. Saviors, but the oldest stained glass windows I know of on Mount Desert Island. I mean, it's circumstantial evidence, but wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. As I mentioned earlier, most of the windows here are in either the opalescent um, sometimes called the American style, like the Tiffany windows, or a more English and traditional style, like the Heaton Butler and Bain windows, opalescent versus traditional. In order to talk about the differences between these two styles of window, we need a basic understanding of how they're made, because what the artists are trying to accomplish is fundamentally different, and it's completely played out in how the windows are built. So, for all of you who have heard about stained glass and construction at every one of these, it's going to be short, I promise. So the first major difference between them is the kind of glass they use. What most of us would call colored glass is technically called pot metal glass because the colors come from metallic salts blended into a pot of molten glass. This produces a glass solidly colored all the way through each piece. The technique has been used since the medieval times and it's what most people think of when you think of stained glass. In medieval windows, details like eyes, noses, mouths were painted on with vitreous enamel paint. It's a dark brown or black paint made of powdered glass mixed with iron, copper, and a liquid medium. It has to be fired in a kiln to fuse it to the background glass. <clears throat> Another very old method for adding detail is silver stain. Silver nitrate is painted on the glass and when it's fired in a kiln, it turns the glass into various shades of transparent yellow, depending on the heat, the firing time, the chemical composition. It is nearly always on the outer surface of the glass. And it looks like on this window, silver stain was used for the halos, trim on the robe, the cherub's hair, the orb, and some other details. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it, but there's also a layer of paint on the glass behind the hands and faces. These are probably a pale colored glass painted with the skin shadows on the outside and the facial features on the inside. 
so that the, the shadows are kind of softened and blurred. Uh, if you look closely, the head of each cherub is constructed of a single piece of glass that includes their hair and halo. So all of the detail in that head comes from enamel paint and silver stain. So if anyone here is a painter, usually when you work in oils or acrylic, you make highlights by adding light colors of paint. Stained glass is the opposite. The light provides the highlights. So they'll put a thin wash of a darker enamel paint across the glass and remove the paint where they want the highlights to be. The most common ways are scratching the paint off with the handle of the brush or with a needle for really fine work and stippling in which you would dab the wet paint off with a hard brush. So basically the, the painted mat is built up and washes on the glass surface. And then there's a really intense process of erasing and rubbing and scratching. Um, you can see this in the detail of the resurrection window on the south side of the nave here. Each set of flowers is on a separate piece of colored glass painted with a black wash, and then the flowers were drawn by scratching off the black. So what we refer to as stained glass often incorporates all of these techniques in one window. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of glass, but the three relevant ones here are antique, cathedral, and opalescent. <clears throat> in the early 19th century, glassmakers began trying to recreate the colors and textures of medieval glass and developed various types of handmade glass known as antique glass. And in this case, antique refers to a style of glass and not its age. It's usually hand blown, it's thick, usually has bubbles and other inclusions and imperfections that refract, refract the light and kind of make it more sparkly and deeper colored. Then there's cathedral glass, which is made by pouring molten glass onto a metal or graphite table and immediately rolling it into a thin sheet using a large metal patterned cylinder, just like a rolling pin on cookie dough. On the left is a cathedral glass window seen from inside with the sunlight shining through. And on the right is the same window seen from outdoors where you can see the texture better. It was an inexpensive, readily available material. So you see it a lot in houses, and it was often used as a placeholder for windows in recently built churches while they're waiting for people to donate windows. Here at St. Saviors, the original nave windows, the dormer windows, and the original, <clears throat> the original rose window were all cathedral glass. Because they're so translucent, cathedral glass and unpainted antique glass throw the most gloriously colored shadows. All right, last type of glass is opalescent. This is the glass most associated with Tiffany windows, although it was used by many other artists and companies. Opalescent refers both to the type of glass and to the style of window it was used in. It's generally a mixture of two or more colors with streaks and swirls and sometimes a milky kind of iridescent surface. It is a lot more opaque than older styles of glass. If you look around, you can tell which the opalescent ones are because they're, they're pretty dark compared to all the others. Um, now, opalescent glass had been used in decorative table items like perfume bottles and little, little bowls and stuff for, I don't know, like 100 years. But in the late 19th century, Louis Comfort Tiffany and John Lafarge began experimenting with using it in stained glass windows. It caught on really quickly, and by 1880, this type of window was extremely popular. There were dozens of firms making opalescent windows. Now, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Somebody always does. But I'm pretty sure neither Tiffany nor Lafarge ever actually constructed a window. They designed the window and worked with glass manufacturers to produce it. So the ideal for an opalescent window for the people working in this style was to avoid using any paint at all to define forms. So Tiffany and Lafarge experimented and developed many different variations of glass to create shape and texture that could replace paint. The only place where they gave up trying to limit themselves that way were faces, hands, and feet. 
which they did paint. There's some very early windows in which they tried to do this just with pieces of glass, not hugely successful. So one of the most characteristic types of opalescent glass is called drapery glass because it looks just like cloth draped over a body. It's really annoying for a photographer because it's super hard to photograph it in a way that shows how sculptural it is. And it also makes it impossible to photograph the whole window because no matter where you put the camera, there's gonna be light bouncing off this stuff. Anyway, if you look around, you'll see some variation of drapery glass in most of the opalescent style windows here. I think the only one that doesn't use drapery glass is the Maitland Armstrong window, the, the rose window up there. Now, the second major difference between opalescent windows and all other stained glass up to this point is in the construction. So here's how a typical traditional leaded glass window gets made. The designer will produce a presentation drawing, usually an ink drawing with watercolor to show the design and suggested glass colors. This is the Willett Studio drawing for the transfiguration window, which is on the north side of the nave. Once the client approves the drawing, the glass studio produces a full-size drawing called a cartoon with thick lines that indicate where the letting will go. Three copies of this are prepared. One drawing gets cut up and used as a template for cutting the glass pieces. Another is used to lay out the cut pieces. And as the window develops, the glass pieces get stuck to a large piece of clear glass mounted on an easel so the artists can see how the colors look together when they're lit from behind, as they would be in a window. Oops. Uh, any glass pieces that need details painted on them, like faces or clothing patterns, go to whoever in the workshop specialized in those. And then they get fired in a kiln to fuse them to the glass. Although there were workshops who did <laughs> painting where the paint didn't get fired. Tiffany did this. So you see Tiffany windows where the faces have almost disappeared, either from weathering or well-meant attempts to clean the glass by people who didn't realize that the paint could get washed off. There, I mean, there are other causes of deteriorating or missing paint, um, usually chemical composition or quality of firing, but this one seems the most avoidable. So I make a point of telling everybody, don't wash your windows. <laughs> All right, so the finished pieces after firing get set into lead cames. These are pieces of lead with an H-shaped profile. The glass fits into either side of that H and then the cames are soldered together. The window gets weatherproofed by rubbing putty into the joints and then installed in a wooden or metal frame. Now in small glass studios, one person might do all of these steps, but in larger companies like the Tiffany Studios or Heaton Butler and Bain, each of these steps would be done by a different person. <laughs> Tiffany was an enormous company that at its peak employed something like 400 people. And in workshops of that size, there were designers, glass cutters, painters, kiln operators, people who soldered, people who assembled the windows. I mean, even the designers had specialties. There were people who just painted hands and people who just drew landscapes. So the really interesting thing that, the, that Tiffany and Lafarge popularized is called plating. Neither of them was the first to do this, but they took this to a new level and it became a hallmark of the opalescent style. Overly simplified, it refers to layering pieces of glass to create new colors or atmospheric effects. So here, the painting was done on a piece of blue glass when layered over pink, it looks purple. And also, not only does it look purple, but when in, in real life, there would be a depth to that color that you wouldn't get from a single piece of glass. So these pieces would be set in lead came as a kind of sandwich, either projecting out from the front or out the back side of the window. And I'll show you a sample of that soon. The technique is also sometimes used in conservation to match historic glass colors that aren't made anymore. On the left is the historic piece and on the right are three different pieces of glass layered together to create that color. So these two windows are over in the north transept. And one really awesome thing about them is that 
behind them is a covered walkway that leads to the rectory. So you can actually stand right at the level of the windows outside and get a really good look at this construction technique. One of the things that I have really come to appreciate since starting this project is windows that are set low. <laughs> it's so disappointing when you go to a cathedral and it's gorgeous, but the windows are up there and you can't see anything. Okay, now here you can see that each cherub head is painted on a single piece of glass with an additional layer on the outside of the glass. And I think what's been done here is that the artist took a piece of clear or slightly milky, like antique glass, painted the faces on the back side of that glass, and then layered it over a second, sort of subtly multicolored opal -y sort of piece. So painting faces on the back of the glass softens the paint lines, and the layered glass gives depth to the colors. On the banner at the bottom, I don't know if this is going to come across on that slide, but um, it looks like the lettering was painted on the front of a piece of clear glass layered over a similar multicolored piece. And the lettering is a lot crisper on the banner than the lines on the face. Okay, sorry, I had to bring in an outside example because this is just such a good one. This is parakeets and goldfish bowl made by Tiffany Glass in 1893. It's at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, so look at the goldfish bowl in the middle. I think that the fish were made of two layers of streaky glass and set into the leads with the main part of the window. Then a single piece of really thick curved glass, which was probably cast specifically for this piece, was set over the fish. So this not only gives the effect of the fish swimming through the water, it blurs and softens the sharp black lines of the lead. Okay, I'm gonna have to switch gears. There's a couple of windows I really want to include and I don't run out, want to run out of time and we can come back to opalescent if we have time. This is the Larch Bow window commissioned from Gabrielle Loire by Sheldon and John Goldthwaite in memory of their father, Sheldon, 1969. I love this window. Those deep blues are just stunning. And Loire was famous for this color. One of his best known works is the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial in Berlin and also known for the Rose Window at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. I mean, sometimes I look around and I'm just like, how did we get such an amazing collection of glass? Um, so Gabrielle Loire was born in Anjou, France in 1904, studied stained glass in the workshop of Nicolas Laurent in Chartres. He opened his own work, workshop in Chartres in 1946. And I love this. Someone asked him in 1969 whether he was thinking of retiring. And he said, retire from what? Retire from imagination, from designing, from dreaming? Um, he passed away in 1996, but the atelier is still in business. And I think it's being run by the third generation of the Loire family. So I met with John and Nancy Goldthwaite last year to talk about how they chose to work with Loire. And after all this research, I've been very curious about the process of how a family decides to give a window and how it's installed and how the subject is chosen and who picks the artist. And in this case, as it happens, Gabrielle Loire was a friend of the family. Nancy's father had been stationed in France with Loire during the war. Um, I'm sorry, um, he was stationed in France with the Supply Corps and became friends with Loire during the war. The family suspects they were in the resistance together. Then Massan de Miraval, a friend of Loire's, was an exporter of religious art in Paris. He and Nancy's father, Edward Amazine, went into business together under the name Loire Imports, dealing in uh, religious art and arranging exhibitions of Loire's work in the United States. So it seemed natural that after John's father passed away in 1965, they asked Loire to make a memorial window, and they asked him to feature the larch which was um, Sheldon Goldthwaite's favorite. And Loire sent this presentation drawing, which the family approved, and we got our window. Um, and I don't, I, I gotta keep moving, but I just wanted to show these photos of Sheldon Goldthwaite and the family. Okay, we have to take a look at Susan Dunlap's work. 
Her window of Christ as a fisher of men is the only stained glass window I have ever seen that made me laugh. The faces on the fish, all the witty details she tucks away in the images, like the mice in the, the Clarence Little window. I asked her about these faces and she said she was drawing on medieval and Romanesque images to emphasize the metaphor of fishing for people. So you've got these sort of half human fish. At the time, she had five children at home. The youngest was two and the family remembers sort of, it sounds like they were brainstorming about what local references could be included like the dory and the flicker and the island. I think her work is witty and charming and I love her use of antique glass. Her windows always throw those like gorgeous multicolored shadows. And it's really easy to lose track of recent history. Something that happened you know, 20 years ago doesn't feel important the way that something that happened 100 years ago does. But if you don't keep track of the 20 years ago, then when it becomes 100 years, you've lost it. So I kind of want to more or less read Mrs. Dunlap's contributions into the record. So here's what I know of her life. She was born Susan Perkins in Anniston, Alabama in 1930 and studied painting and illustration at the Art Institute of Chicago where she met Robert Dunlap. They married in 1951, moved to MDI. They worked as potters and weavers, raised sheep and five children and Susan worked in stained glass as well. A lot of her glass was apparently brought from France and she imported a kiln from England to fire the painted sections of the windows. She only made a few windows that I know of. There are four here on MDI, three of them here in St. Xavier's, and there's one in Garden City, New York. And she also did a large mosaic in St. Andrew's, Millinocket. She lives in Orland now, where she and her daughter Jenny have a weaving business. Oh, so I wanted to talk more about the difference between opalescent windows and traditional windows, but I think I'd better skip ahead um, and show you some of the research that I've done. Just, just so that the information gets out there and everybody knows that this stuff exists. So the Reed Memorial window was installed in 1889. It's signed the Tiffany Glass Company. It's based on a detail from Fra Angelico's Linaiole Tabernacle, 1433, currently in Florence. Um, it shows the enthroned Madonna and there are 12 angel musicians in the arch surrounding her. Our angel is one of them. Um, and in Tiffany's 1897 published a list of windows, they call this Reed Memorial Window slash Fra Angelica Angel. We don't know when the second angel window was installed. We don't even know whose memory it was given because nobody knows who the initials stand for. But it is signed Tiffany and it shares quite a few stylistic and compositional details with the Reed Memorial. It seems likely to have been made around the same time. The 1902 blueprint I mentioned earlier specifies that there's a memorial window to be removed to make room for the organ and placed in the cloister. Um, and the location shown is where this window and the Burnham window are located now, again, in the North transept. I kind of think that these two windows were moved to make room for the arched opening to the new chapel, because there were two openings of this size and shape in, you can see in the old photos. Um, Tiffany called this one the Gordon Memorial Window slash Angel of Praise. Um, since it was published in their 19, 1897 list, it must have been installed between Helen Gordon's death in 1894 and that publication in 1897. So we pinned it down to within a three years. Yay. Tiffany copyrighted many of their window designs. This is the drawing filed at the Library of Congress for what they call the Easter Angel Design. It was copyrighted May 22, 1895 by Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. And unusually, it credits the design to Joseph Lauber. Usually Tiffany Windows didn't, didn't credit the individual designers. As you can see, this was a very popular image. Um, there are a lot more of this window out there. I just picked a few. 
This is the Frederick Joy Memorial window designed by Frederick Wilson for Tiffany Studios, dedicated on Easter Sunday, 1908. And a little digression, this photo shows several of the really tricky things about photographing stained glass. One is that opalescent glass is a lot darker than the clear glass used for faces. So it takes a lot of work to get both the face and the entire rest of the window exposed equally. Another is that you need the light outside the stained glass window to be quite a bit brighter than the light inside, or you see too much of the leading and the surface of the glass, as in this photo. Again, this is another copyright drawing at the Library of Congress, um, filed for the Salve Regina design in 1898. And um, I found one other window you, that was based on this design. Okay, this one is really weird. I believe that this was made by Heaton Butler and Bain, although I can't prove that yet. I spent quite some time trying to track down the source of this image because it sure looks like it came from a 19th century lithograph. But I have not found a print with that exact composition. I did find a very similar sketch when I went through Frederick Wilson's scrapbook. And then his drawing of this composition was published in Tiffany's 1896 catalog. These are two of the most famous popular paintings of the subject. Um, on the left is Heinrich Hoffmann's drawing, and on the right is a print done from a painting by Bernhard Plockhorst. These were ubiquitous, like they were in the Bible with pictures, they were framed on walls, um, they were used as the front of, of pamphlets. It was really hard to avoid work by these two artists. So Frederick Wilson undoubtedly knew these. And if you look, the, the little girl in his drawings is almost identical to the one on the left in the Heinrich Hoffmann drawing. This was also a very popular design for Tiffany. Um, and stained glass studios constantly used popular prints in famous paintings, like that was normal. This is the first time I have ever seen one stained glass company use a design by another stained glass company, particularly an English company using an opalescent style composition. So maybe there's a print out there somewhere that both artists used as an inspiration but otherwise it's just odd. Uh, this is, um, oh, sorry. Um, this was installed in 1937. It was designed by Edwin Denby, a New York City architect who summered here and kept an office here. And it was executed by Wilbur H. Burnham of Boston. Loosely based on a painting by Raphael, and a very full correspondence between Burnham and Denby and Dr. Thorndike here at the church regarding this window is in Burnham's papers at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. Um, this is the resurrection window in memory of Harry Thorndike installed in 1939. This has been attributed to Margaret Redmond. I am 98% sure it's by Edwin Stanton George, a director at Tiffany Studios who opened his own studio when Tiffany closed. I'm guessing it was attributed to Redmond on the basis of this rough sketch at the Archives of American Art, which is labeled St. Saviors on the back. But first off, that's not Margaret Redmond's style. And second, that is like the kind of sketch you draw on the back of a napkin. So maybe. He was talking to somebody at the church, but they decided to go with Stanton George instead. There are several mentions of this window in the Northeast, Fiscal Journal at the time, uh, attributing it to Edwin Stanton George. And it definitely fits better with George's style than Redmond's. This is a Edwin Stanton George drawing at the Raquel Library. And, you know, you can't, I can't attribute a work based on just on style, but there's some real similarities between the way he handles his angels. So there we have that. This one installed 1958, made by James Powell and Sons, also known as Whitefriars Glass. 
It's not signed, but it has the company's logo, a white friar down in the bottom right corner. And in Powell's order books, which are at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the design is attributed to Colwyn Morris. And the full-size cartoons for this window are at the Rakow Research Library. The drawings and copies of correspondence for this window are in the Willett archives. This is the transfiguration window. Um, shoot, I didn't write down what year this was. Now, one interesting thing about this is that Willett Hauser sent St. Saviors a box of all the documentation for this window. Willett kept the drawing and they kept copies of all the correspondence, but they sent St. Saviors what they call a memory box and all of the correspondence is in there. It's pretty cool. Um, apparently I talk a lot faster than I expected to because um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, it's funny how nervous I get before a talk and once I get going, it's like hard to stop. Um, does anybody have questions? I mean, I, I do have a couple more things that I could show you if you're interested. So this is the window that's over the altar. And this is a drawing. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, there's just a couple of things. Um, and this is a Heaton, Bain, Heaton Butler and Bain drawing um, that I think our window was based on. Yeah. Um, the Burnham window. Uh, so this was also a popular theme with Tiffany, although they adapted it a little bit more freely. Um, I haven't seen one exactly like ours. Although there are several that use both the banner with um, the quotation or just the cherub heads get reused. And I don't have, um, I don't have an exact match of this, but I think that these cherubs were, the originals were drawn by Frederick Wilson. I did find this drawing in his papers at the Rakow. And okay, one last thing, I think, yeah. One last thing, um, a number of people have remarked on how thick Christ's neck is in this photograph, uh, in this window. And I think that that's deliberate. I think that there's a whole series of prints and windows in which he has exactly that, that those proportions. And I think they all come from this painting by Bernhard Plockhorst, which like with the, the blessing of the children was an incredibly popular and frequently reproduced image. So I kind of think that was deliberate. And okay, now I'm done. <laughs> okay, questions? Yes, back in the 80s, I think. No, and it probably never will. It was probably bought by a private collector. Well, I wasn't here at the time, but I believe that they came from the outside and just took the whole window out. Does anybody know? Yeah. Oh. Hi, Dunlaps. Thanks for coming. Yeah. It took a run through what? <laughs> Thank you.
they do. It's it's kind of a, a little, I don't want to use the word cluttered, but I just did. Um, it, there, there's a lot more going on in it than a lot of them. Over there with the angel faces and the daisies. Um, it's right next to the door on, on the that side there. Yeah, and there's another one in um, Williamstown. Yeah, so, but that wasn't given by her parents. It was by, yeah. Yeah. One interesting thing is that the figure in the Heaton Butler and Bain painting or um, window, Burnham window, is the same figure that's in a window in a Heaton Butler and Bain window at St. Mary's. It's taken, it's taken from the presentation of the Virgin by Titian. <laughs> I'm trying to see if anybody else. Okie dokie. <laughs> Great. Thank you all for attending this talk here at Tabor's.